Mike, so you're, you're, this is your last semester in high school. You're 12 years old and you're about to move to the next phase of life. Are you considering, if you can give us a, a bit of a background, what do you think is going to be your next step? Are you considering going to university or are you going to uh, focus on your own projects, which, which are already off the ground? Thank you. Um, well, you know, there's, I'm weighing all my options. So I've actually applied to a, a Thiel Fellowship. And then I'm also applied to many different colleges, all of the Ivy Leagues here in, in the U.S. So I'm, uh, I'm undecided yet as to where I'm going to go or how I'm going to go to, uh, you know, do, uh, like you said, do I grow my, my projects or do I go to college? It's definitely a big decision at 12, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I will uh, see when the decisions come out and weigh all my decisions. So what programs did you apply to? Uh, well, I applied to so many, um, MIT, okay. Harvard, Stanford, WPI, which is also in Massachusetts, and then Georgia Tech, let's see, um, Caltech. Um, what about the field? Are you going to robotics or uh, artificial intelligence? Um, well, that kind of wise, I really haven't decided that, but could go business side since you know i kind of know something a lot of the tech side so maybe i need a business degree or an entrepreneurial degree and then maybe a dual degree with say computer science and business or something along those lines that's really interesting that you also want to dabble into uh business not just tech because you've 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 pretty much learned a lot about technology all by yourself that's right start learning you know you're a self-taught coder you've learned about deep learning about artificial intelligence you've learned python at some point um can you can you tell us a bit how did you reach the point where you started learning those languages at what at what age did you start noticing that you have this talent out there and that you that you wanted to discover more so um you know i, I really didn't know that i was ahead in this entire field of robotics and technology, really until I got to interact with others doing robotics. And I think this was at age six when my parents had actually got me an age variance to attend a robotics program at a major university in the US. And it was really at this program that I quickly realized even though I was the youngest there, I had become quite proficient and skillful at developing programs and constructing robots with the Lego Mindstorms at the time to complete a task. And even really though that the other participants were more than twice my age, I actually quickly became the TA, which was definitely <laughs> not what I had envisioned to start out with. Uh, and I really want to expand on my previous knowledge. Um, needless to say, when I realized in that short time that I've been teaching myself robotic programming, that I quickly surpassed what was considered this exceptional level for my age. So really, that's kind of where I said, okay, I want to learn more about this. And it was still at six years old. I think I had probably six. Yeah, I had taken over my dad's desk. So I, if you can imagine me, I put my computer beside of his I would use his over here to look over all on <laughs> online videos, GitHub repositories, Stack Overflow questions, documentation, whatever it was. And while I would use my computer to the actual programming. And I actually recall that I had to sit on my knees because I wasn't tall enough to reach the desk. And, you know, that really, this was my outlet. And when I came home from school, I could really spend hours in there because I would just lose track of time. And the really the great thing about me teaching myself how to program was that I really learned most of my math skills before I was even out of the second grade because I needed them for programming. Mm. I think, you know, an example of that is my mom has a great picture of me that we'll, we'll share with you. And it was when I was seven years old and it shows me it was I was strapped to my car seat, holding on to this favorite stuffed animals, wearing Disney pajamas and covered up in a Star Wars blanket. But I was reading a college textbook on object-oriented programming in Python. No so, way. <laughs> you know, this, this whole, even while I was traveling, didn't have hotspot or anything, I would still find myself wanting to learn something from this field. And I also like to use that picture to illustrate the big gap between 
you know, I have this high intellectual age, but I'm still a kid. I have that still calendar age. I have the Hot Wheels track around the corner. You know, I'm still got to be a kid. And that's really a good picture to illustrate that. Did you know that you were gifted at such a young age? Or was it your parents that first saw it? I think that I think that the, the knowing that I was gifted was really, you know, of course, I see myself through my own eyes as normal. But, um, you know, that was my I'm the only child and my nephews are much older than me. So they really didn't have any any different thing from I did that didn't really have too much to go off of no comparison. So really when I was at a summer camp at two and writing my name on sidewalk chalk on the side of the, on the, the sidewalk. And they were like the, the camp counselors you know, paying it to my parents. They were like, did you know your, your kid could write his name and do math? And there she was like, uh, yeah, he's been doing that for years. What's, what's, you know, what's the big deal. Right. Um, so I got tested to get into early kindergarten preschool and uh, because I had a September birthday and that was when they came up with the thing that they said that I was gifted and that so they were like okay we did we had no we had no idea so and my, myself I think it was at you know it was really again at that program where I said okay uh, I think I might be a little bit different than everyone else in this field and, and in general How did it feel growing up and being surrounded by people that are much older than you, sometimes twice your age? So, um, you know, be, being or I like being around people and even sometimes young, uh, older people that where we can really, we can talk about similar things and similar interests because, you know, I can say, for example, I can talk about with my high school friends, we could talk about, you know, my, uh, some of my projects or different sciences behind stuff and cool new things along that. But also my, the peers, my age that I have, we talk about racing and stuff like that, the kids stuff. So, and I think being around people that are older than me, I'm able to, you know, gr grab insights from others and learn more and, you know, show more of what I know. And, and I really like to do that with others and friends and even colleagues. But in terms of chemistry, are you able to relate to people that are your age? Because the reference I have, for example, is I, I've probably given this example a few times in the past few uh, podcast episodes. But I'm, I'm currently uh, living at my uncle's place here in Dubai and he has a 14 year old son very smart guy um you know for his age he's very talented in science but you know he's doing what a what your average 14 year old teenager does which is gaming you know you go see chill with your friends but then in your case you're here you're learning about programming you're talking you, you know you were talking before this podcast we were talking about cars and electric vehicles and mclarens and all those things are you able to relate on a friendship level with those people Yes. So, you know, I'm actually, people say that I'm really good at that because, and I'll tell you in many of my speeches that I can build a robotic behavior to be sold around the world one minute. And then the next log a couple of miles on my knees while playing with Hot Wheels, <laughs> you know, or even play with my friends, play online with video games. Of course, that's the big thing during COVID. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I really have this ability that people say, where I can, like, you know, with you, again, like I was saying, we're talking about this, this high-level stuff, but then I can also say dial down the, to simple conversations about the cars and racing and those kind of things. I'm talking to, say, my friends, and having that, that level like that is something that many people say I can do, and it's a benefit to me because I can talk to all kinds of people. Whether you're two or 82, I can still talk to you. Going back, circling back to the point of the education, Do you think that the education system favors people like you that have a certain level, a higher level of intellectual capacity? Do you think that the education system played in your advantage, in your growth as an individual? Or did you do most of your learning after school? I think uh, really the education system has been a, a huge struggle for me as being, being 12 and moving at, a, at the faster pace that I am. And really... 
I've learned everything I know. You know, I, I, I'm, obviously you can see I'm a programmer. I got the, the multi-screens, the robots and the <laughs> development board, <laughs> IoT devices, et cetera. I, I, I learned all of that myself. That, that was everything I did was myself. And really, I, I, I don't think that the education system was definitely not a smooth journey for sure. I had countless obstacles that were thrown at me and they were trying to hold me back from actually reaching my potential. And I truly don't think that the education system now is really set up to handle teaching for friendly gifted students. And I had to find my own way through the system. And that's how I, you know, graduating at 12 years old today. Yeah. And because it was really because of that, that boring, the that fact that school was boring me was really why I wanted this outlet. And that's where programming filled the whole, the void for me because I wanted to learn something new. I wanted to challenge something and I wanted something that had no limit. And programming was the answer for me. And really, that was kind of where I started to love this field. And that, and that's really why, because I really wanted something challenging. You mentioned obstacles. You had to face obstacles. What types of obstacles were they? Age was the biggest one. Uh, definitely age, along with credibility. It, it, on that, you know, side by side. Because honestly... You know, they, they, they want to make me into this box for every grade intelligence. And really, I was out of this box trying to get, get out of the box, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow me to do that. Um, you know, with age was the biggest one. And then also intelligence and knowledge don't equal each other. And that, that, was, that was another one where I was in second grade and I asked my teacher to teach me something new during a recess. And well, instead of teaching me something new, she gave me a clipboard and, and to put in the hallway of a fourth grade math test. And because I didn't ace that, I couldn't get something new where the potential to learn and intelligence definitely does not equal the ability to learn. I just want to learn. I'm a sponge. I can learn anything you can give me. So we actually left that school. I found a school that were definitely great. They facilitate the idea that I can go, I would like to go at my own pace. And that's kind of how I've gotten to where I am today. Talking about learning, what are you uh, currently working on? So I guess in the school wise, um, finishing up my ca classes, calculus classes I'm taking now, and then also business law one uh, as an elective class. And then on the, the, the code programming side, I'm yeah. actually working on my, my startup, Reflect Social which uh, I'll tell you about that in a little bit, but I've also previously been working on COVID contact tracing with MIT, where we've been trying to figure out how to get the data correct for all of these different phones and different orientations or different Bluetooth signals, et cetera. So definitely got a bunch of different projects and stuff going on, but I like to handle all of it. How did you work with the MIT on this project? Were you helping them? Because I know you're big with IoT. That's a subject you're very interested in. Did you help them on this side of the equation? So uh, not really on that side of the equation, but in, for the MIT side, I actually got in with the Lincoln Labs laboratory. And then they were working on, obviously, blue, a co contact tracing at this over the summer. So we had to figure out how to use this Bluetooth low energy signal. And that was really something new for me. I really hadn't worked with Bluetooth that much. So... Uh, we talked about that and also the ethics of the data. That was something new that I hadn't learned before was, okay, are we saving people's data or can this be used against them, et cetera. And I think that was definitely an, an interesting, a new experience for me. I really hadn't done before, which I thought was pretty cool. But yeah, I definitely am and in really into the, the, the IoT world, but that um, I'm, I'm in a lot of areas of technology, really. <laughs> You are. If what's your favorite one? Because there's there's a few big ones. There's IoT. There's robotics. There's AI, which kind of all merge together, but they're all each their own individual field. Yeah, I mean, I think robotics is definitely one of my favorites. For you know, uh, it, it's 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 definitely interesting where we can you know IoT is basically just a smart device that has a little a few capabilities, right? It basically, every IoT device is a form of robot, and every robot needs AI. 
So it, it's it's almost like robotics is the main huge bubble that all of this is linked together in. And I think because of that, that's really why I like that field is merging all of these awesome areas together into one whole thing. Talking about robotics, actually, th there it is. You, I had listened to an interview of yours. I, rem I believe it was from an interview with Robot Report back in 2019. And you had mentioned that the last job that will exist will be that of a developer coding robotics. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, um, you know, get, get going back to that and then now kind of thinking back on it, I think that's a long way off. You know, that, that that's a, definitely a long shot from where we're at now. And I honestly, you know, many people fear this idea that robots are going to take jobs, but I honestly don't fear that. And, but however, what I, you know, what I do fear is this idea of the acceptance of robots. Are they going to be good, uh, going to be perceived as good and helpful? Because really the, the current perception in this general masses is, a, is very negative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, we were talking about the last job, right? And I think robots actually will augment jobs instead of replace them. So the, the last job will actually be someone working with a robot and we will always need someone whether that's a, a programmer or even a handler to to help the, make sure the robot's doing their task correctly etc so we will definitely always need job working with robots both behind the screen and in front of the screen so you lie more on the uh, pessimistic side of robotics as of now the way you see AI and robotics developing, you're more worried than optimistic. Is that correct? No, definitely not. I mean, um, you know, I, I think I'm kind of really in the middle. I would definitely, I, I think that we will definitely augment jobs, but I think, you know, I think the advancements that we're, we're seeing, uh, maybe scare people, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, I mean, really, I I don't really fear it. I don't really fear AI or robotics in general because of all I know is it's just as much of a length of code. And uh, but but yeah, that's really. You know, there's an interesting quote. I believe it's from Yuval Noah Harari, who has a beautiful book. It's uh, called Homo Deus, and Yuval is a he's a futurist. And I believe there's a quote in there that says that AI by itself shouldn't be feared. But it's humans using AI, that's where it becomes dangerous. And that actually brings me to my second question. You are for the regulation of technology. Yes. Why is that? So um, I definitely feel that there needs to be a lot of work done on that regulatory side in order for it to catch up with this fast-paced development of AI like we've been saying. And what I like to do is I would like to use a cognitive scale, say from zero to 10, 10 being an exact copy of a human with common sense, intuition, make its own opinions, et cetera. And then within that scale, I think we should be able to safely operate between that four to six range where say a robot is smart enough to take voice commands, have chatbot capabilities or detect objects and humans and avoid them or interact with them. But not definitely not override the code, make artificial decisions, etc. And really recently, I've been proposing this idea for a world council of robots, much like the World Health Organization or FDA, where we have this checks and balances on for the robotic and AI companies before their product is released, just as we do medicine and food now. And of course, just like every regulatory organization or law there will always be that small fraction of those who operate without regard for the laws and i think you know it's it's not really the robot itself it's the application of it and that that's definitely like like he was saying it's the human how they're using the ai not the ai that's it that's that's really true so your proposition is to cap the level of intelligence of a robot between a four and a six for now yes i, I think so until we until we can, if we say get up there in the next five years to that seven to 10 level, which is highly unlikely, um, I think we can still like, you know, that that's that maybe we can reevaluate it when we get to that point. But I say for now, 
we can put these four to six kind of range in place and keep it for there for now. Your mission behind uh, your company, Next Era Innovation, is to really create robots that will augment human lives. Can you give us a few examples of what are some of the robot tasks or the jobs that you could foresee robots augmenting the quality of a human and a worker's life? Well, um, I think uh, the, the armed robots are definitely doing something very, very making jobs very safer, et cetera, where, you know, maybe we have a, a metal worker, for example, right? And you really don't want to stand too me- uh, to that molten metal, that steel very, very close to it. Or say a robot could do that, right? And, it, and then the, it, we would, you could just watch it behind glass. And I think that, that idea, and then also helping, say, the aging populations, where, you know, the simple tasks around the house, et cetera, as they're aging. Um, but that that's really a uh, some of the main ones. But then we're, we're almost, we have that, that safer part, but then we also have that better part, where, mm-hmm. you know, if you can have a robot fold your clothes for you, then that'd be awesome. Or if you can have, you know, nowadays we have robot vacuum cleaners, where that that's kind of a big hot topic now. So the, those kind of making life easier, without chores, et cetera, you know, we have, we have better lives because then the family can be together more longer, et cetera. So I think that uh, those are some of the, the good ideas behind, I have behind robots helping and making lives better and safer. Do you have any industries you're particularly excited about? Um, you know, one big one is definitely um, uh, autonomous cars. And then, you know, electric cars, like we were talking about before. And then also IoT is another big one. The whole Mars missions. I, I, again, I might know a bunch of areas <laughs> of technology. But, uh, you know, just talking about next era, I think we can kind of spread off into my startup. I can discuss about that called Reflect Social. Yeah, I'd love to hear Which I've that. been working on for the past nine months. It's actually going to be spin off under next era. And then I'm actually combining these big advances in the world of IoT and I'm going to put the fact, the fun factors of the new sites like TikTok, et cetera. And that and Reflect runs on actually what's called Horizon OS, which is an operating system that I built a couple of years ago to standardize the IoT business and company or everyone and combine them into a very more user-friendly platform, et cetera. So that's a little fun thing I've been working on and hopefully it will release in the next few months. But uh, But yeah. For sure, that's kind of where I'm at is IoT, Mars, autonomous cars, robots, you name it, I'm into it. Let's let's talk about the IoT thing for a bit because this is not an industry that I'm particularly familiar, familiar about. So I'd love to, to hear from you and to learn from you. So uh, you were saying that there's a problem, not necessarily a problem, but the state of the industry in IoT right now is that there is no... Um, centralized platform for all those projects um really at this point there's you know if you have 20 different device companies in your home you're gonna need 20 different apps and to me if you're if you're trying to turn off your lights when you come home or turn on your lights when you come home i don't think it'd be nice to to go to 15 20 different apps all to turn your lights on or something very simple like that but the, the standardization between not only the devices like that, but also the, the integration between them is definitely something that needs to be fixed. And I definitely would like to fix, but you know, the, the companies don't like to talk to each other really um, kind of like the IOT devices yeah. don't, we, they all communicate in different forms, different languages, a, a, everything's different about them. And I'm basically the translator. I'm the big translator in the middle that says I can take what you speak and translate it to what you speak and then spit it back out. So th- that's really the whole idea behind Horizon OS, which is the whole back end to reflect social. And then we also hope to do this in a very both fun and easy way for, for people to use. Oh, that's super interesting. So you would see people using Horizon OS uh, primarily initially at home correct where you would connect your smart light with your smart tv and your smart fridge and your smart toaster if you have that yeah that's that's really the uh that's really the original the designed industry 
thing. Yes, that's right. I originally designed Horizon OS actually for my mom who had spinal surgery this past spring. And she actually couldn't get up from the bed very easily. And she, she could see if someone was at the door. So what I actually made her was I took my a ring doorbell and a smart door lock. And I developed a facial recognition algorithm for the five people that would check on her in our family while dad and I, I was at, dad was at work and I was at school. And basically it was facial recognize the person at the door. And if it was a friend that it detected, it would unlock the door. Or if it was someone else, like a delivery person, say for example, did not know, it would make sure the door was locked and I actually send a text to my dad, my dad and my phone. And it would say, okay, would, would you like me to unlock the door with a picture of who it was? So that was kind of that idea of combining the, the ring doorbell with the, the smart lock and the facial recognition and the texting, all these integrations together in this very complicated mesh of stuff. That was really the whole idea behind Horizon OS because I noticed in doing that project that there's definitely not a lot of standardization that's really where i could where i saw that from and really i also saw the applications of that where say that a blind person giving them more independence that actually made me think that idea have you ever thought of spinning this product off as a separate company itself yes i very well have um de definitely it's been it's been discussed and talked about for sure um but yeah i mean it, it's it's i would love to do something like get you know I love to give this, get, be given the chance to develop this in a much better way, and but you know it's hard to get people involved into in, the, in, the, in the, this at a at my you know being twelve and being taken serious for my credibility. So, um, but yeah, I would definitely have thought about it for sure. I think that's why you're contemplating business. Yeah, that for sure. I mean, I'm thinking this whole the business side of things is something that. I'm, I'm for this is it, I'm looking at it pretty hard, and then um, you know if if anyone out there would, who sees this and wants to help me develop it, you can contact me and then we can work together and get this thing out to the public for sure. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's, there's going to be links in the description. Mike, I received a few questions from the worldwide engineering community for you. How would it sound if how would it sound if I um, ask you some of those questions and maybe you can ask answer them rapid fire go ahead cool so the first question is from jesus underscore maza rajos what would be the main problem in human life that your company wants to mitigate Ooh. Mm. good question good question I think, um, you know, in general, I think I, we really want to make life simpler and less stressful where, you know, we, we, we all overcomplicate things in the world where we, it's, it's everything so complicated nowadays that we, we need to make that simpler. And that's what I want to do is I want to help say one, one of the big things I want to help is our elderly and to, you know, and disabled say, you know, be able to do those household chores, those, you know, and even have a possible companion uh, and keep, keep their independence. And that, that's really one of the, the big things that drives me to, to do something is the elderly and disabled. And even an example of like with Horizon OS and a, or like a robot or something, all of those, that's really my main goal is that is to build technology that enables people to live both better and safer lives no matter how that is, to reflect through robots, through whatever. That's what I want to do. Awesome. Second question by Andrew Mach. Again, a uh, really active fan of worldwide engineering. Thank you. How do you imagine the world to be when you grow up? Whew. Interesting. Interesting questions. Maybe we can take the angle of like robotics. How would you see... Well, first, you know, on my car side, there's probably going to be flying cars. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's... Um, yeah, this is an interesting question. 
Um, hopefully there's going to be a robot in every house and we'll get around the entire perception of things where we can, again, like I'm saying, we can hopefully get to that goal where we can have robots helping people in the home, doing those, those, doing those chores. And, you know, um, I, I think hope we might be living on Mars, depending on how fast Elon Musk over there goes. (laughs) Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's all, there's very interesting subjects to think about in this entire, the future of things, but the, that robotics cars and Mars thing is, I'm really excited to see what we come up with here because we're definitely moving at an exponential rate. By the way, someone in the comment section of worldwide engineering called you the next Elon Musk. So you have a high reference point to, uh, you have a high reference point to, to, uh, go up to. Thank and you, final, <laughs> it is a final question, Mike. Um, and this one is from Aswin, seven PK. Please ask him. So, what is your daily routine? And did you have any mentor? So, daily routine. Um, get up. Of course, during COVID, that's a little bit different than before. Um, you know. Uh, School, usually school. Uh, do Right now I'm doing, I would say, all online classes. And then usually after school, it's uh, back, it's upstairs here and, you know, work on whether it's a little project I got or, uh, you know, working on my company. And then after that, it's video games with friends. So you can see that the big, the big difference there is, you know, get up high school programming slash company, video games with friends, stay up late and do whatever. And then go to bed back again and do it all again. Do you have a strict uh, sleeping schedule? Not really. Um, of course, during COVID and thanks to online classes, of course, not really. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, uh, but yeah, that's just kind of my main schedule. How many hours of sleep do you get per, on average per night? Uh, well, it depends. See, sometimes I will tell you. Um, you know, I, I sit there in the middle of the night um, and thinking about ro- programming bugs and <laughs> new projects and stuff. So I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I should do. And then I end up getting the thing right and fix my bug the next day. Um, so usually eight or nine, but depending on if I'm working on a big project and it might be a little bit less. Awesome. Mike, where can people learn more about you? So you can learn more about me on my, my LinkedIn page and also my Next Era Innovations page, Mike Wimmer, and it's nexterainnovations.com. That's my website. And you can find all my social links on there and a little bit, learn a little bit more about me. Awesome. I'll put all those links in the description of the podcast. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I had a great time. <laughs>